has there ever been a time where somebody just done you wrong and you wanted to get revenge on them? You planned it, but then your plan backfired? Does that ever happen in life? Usually a pretty common thing. Um, we find that that typically happens in dating relationships. Let me give you a couple examples. So uh, a woman found out that her uh, guy was cheating on her. So uh, later that night, she went to his house about one or two in the morning with a crowbar, bashed the windows to his car, and took a knife and slashed all his tires. She went back to her house that night feeling very good about the revenge, slept well, but then to her surprise, she got a knock at the door about, oh, nine in the morning. It was the police officers. And they arrested her because her boyfriend's neighbor had a surveillance camera that caught it all on tape. Whoa, talk about a backfire there. In another situation, same type of deal, guy and a girl, they're dating, the guy cheats on the, on the girl, she wants her revenge, she waits for the perfect time, he goes on a business trip, so she goes over to his house, again at night, and she has some uh, spray adhesive, sprays it all over his nice sports car, takes glitter, throws glitter all over the car, and then takes some pink uh, spray paint and paints his sports car pink with glitter. Isn't that awesome? But it backfired. She became allergic to all the spray paint, and her whole body broke out in rashes and boils. Had to go to the hospital. Oh, revenge. Oh, and then finally, uh, there were these two sisters, and um, they, uh, they'd play Barbies together, but the older sister wouldn't let the younger sister play with the special collector Barbies, okay? I'm a father of three daughters. I know about these things, all right? She wouldn't let her play the collector daughter. So the younger daughter wanted to get revenge on the older daughter. So when the older daughter was gone, the younger daughter grabbed the collector Barbies and burned their hair on a hot light bulb. <laughs> Problem was she also burned up the living room. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> and the moral of that story is uh, then all they had to play with were bald Barbies. And that's creepy. <laughs> so anyway. We're talking about vengeance. We're talking about revenge. If you've got your note sheets, that's where we're going to start. Pretty common thing. It seems that our gut instinct, when somebody hurts us, what do we want to do? We want to hurt them back. They hit us. We hit them twice as hard. We want to get even. We want to retaliate. We want to get our, our revenge. That seems to be the fleshly nature, right? But the question is, how is a believer in Jesus Christ to respond? when people hurt us, when they cause us or our loved ones pain? Um, do we have that option of, of retaliation when we've been done wrong? Well, we've been working our way through the book of Romans. And uh, Paul, the apostle who wrote this letter to the believers in the small house churches in Rome in about 57 AD, here's what he said, because Rome was, uh, was kind of a crazy place, and believers would be persecuted for their faith. They'd be kicked around, um, whether you were Jewish or, or not Jewish. You know, this, this, these Jesus followers were weird. They, they drank the blood of the God that they worshipped and, and ate his body, and they didn't understand these things, and they thought Christians were pretty weird. And uh, so they had a lot of persecution, a lot of wrong done to them. So Paul writes in his letter, he says this in Romans 12, 17, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If your enemy is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Don't you love the way scripture just nails it, right? Verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's God's word for this morning that we're going to uh, dive into. But before we do, let's talk with God. Father in heaven, I thank you for each and every person here. Lord, you've called us here for a reason. 
You've called us here to sing your praises, called us here to hear uh, this specific message from your word today. You've called others who are uh, making a public confession of their faith in your son Jesus by baptism, and we give you thanks for all these things. We pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to your word. In your son Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, Amen. So how do we respond to that desire within us for revenge? Well, number one, we need to think before reacting. Now, it's pretty common, right? Somebody hurts us, we react. They cause us pain, we're going to cause them pain. They hurt our kids, we're going to hurt their kids. I mean, whatever it is, right? Uh, listen, that quick reactions might, might be good to have if you're an athlete, if you're playing a sport. But man, it is usually not advised to react quickly when you're in conflict with someone else, especially if you desire revenge. So again, the Apostle Paul says in Romans 12, 17, he's talking to believers. If you're a believer in Jesus, these words are definitely for you. The bar is raised for, for Christians. Repay no one evil for evil. Now in the Old Testament, it was tit for tat. It was an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth right? That's how things went, and that was very common in the, in the ancient world as well. But again, now we're followers of Jesus. How do we respond when we've been done wrong? And the word is, we don't repay evil for evil, but we give thought. Underline that, circle it, highlight it. We give thought when we're hurt. We don't just react to do what is honorable in the sight of all, believers, or the community at large. There's a difference between revenge and vengeance. When we're talking about revenge, it's personal. We want to retaliate. We want to get back at the individual who hurt us or our loved ones. You know, we don't care about justice. We just want to get them back in our way. We take justice into our own hands. Now, there's three reasons why a believer shouldn't repay evil for evil. And the first is uh, the commands of Scripture override the cultural norms, right? I mean, especially today in, in what month are we in? June <laughs> of 2023, right? Our culture is pretty whacked out right now as far as what the Bible teaches. Can I have an amen to that to anybody that's here? Yeah. We're way out of, out of alignment on those things. But here's the thing. We are captive to the word of God. We obey God's word before we obey the cultural norms. So if the culture says, yeah, man, you, somebody does you wrong, you do them wrong. Right? Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. That's not what my Jesus says. Secondly, it's a matter of our Christian testimony to others. If we're just seeking revenge like everybody else, right, then are we, are, are, we, are we being a good testimony of what it means to follow Jesus? Probably not. And, and thirdly, is Jesus modeled it himself. Jesus didn't go out, you know, zapping people for revenge. When they made him mad, when they mistreated him, Jesus didn't operate that way. He operated in love, grace, and forgiveness. So now this might beg the question, is it a sin for believers to, to stand up for themselves or others when we're done wrong? No, we can stand up for ourselves. We're not just supposed to be punching bags, okay? And take it, but we don't seek our own revenge upon others. <laughs> Listen, it's not super spiritual to remain silent or do nothing when we've been wronged or hurt physically, emotionally, or spiritually. Um, David was a good example of this. David in the Old Testament, um, he stood up for himself without taking revenge with a guy named King Saul. King Saul was paranoid. He knew that God was with David and he was jealous of David he felt threatened that David was going to take his throne. And so King Saul and his army spent seven to eight years chasing David around the wilderness of Jerusalem and Judea. 
and he, David was on the run, okay? And I mean, how would you like that? <laughs> the most powerful person in the country and his army are trying to kill you. Yeah, that's the kind of, st you think you're under stress? Wow, think of that stress that David had to live with for all that time. So the Bible tells us that at some point when King Saul and his army were looking for David, that uh, King Saul had to go to the bathroom, basically, okay? So he, he found a cave, and he went into the, into the cave, and he started to go to the bathroom. It was the same cave where David and his men were hiding. So David's men sees, it's, 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 it's David, David, it's King Saul. He's going to the bathroom. This is perfect. Let's kill him. Let's kill him right now. Just take him out. You can get your revenge. It would have been a perfect opportunity. What's he going to do? So... Uh, David says, no, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. But here's what David did. He snuck up secretly in the dark, uh, and, and somehow he was able to get a knife, and he cut off a little corner of King Saul's robe, and then he retreated back into the cave. Well, King Saul finished his business, went outside the cave, rejoined his army in the general vicinity, and then David came out of the cave and confronted King Saul with the evil and the harm that he had perpetrated against him. And so David said this in 1 Samuel chapter 24, starting at verse 9. David said to King Saul, Why do you listen to the words of men who say, Behold, David seeks your harm. Behold, this day your eyes, King Saul, have seen how the Lord gave you into my hand into the cave. And some of my men told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed, the Lord's chosen king. It's not my job to take you out. Verse 11, see my father. Why would he call him father? Because King Saul was David's father-in-law. David was married to one of Saul's daughters. Listen, I've had issues with my father-in-laws in the past, but nothing like this, okay? This is taking it over the line, all right? Man, <laughs> see my father, see the corner of your robe. I got a piece of your robe in my hand, King Saul. Uh, for by the fact that I cut off the corner of your robe and I didn't kill you, you may know and see that there's no wrong or treason in my hands. Okay, I had every opportunity, but I didn't take out my revenge on you. I haven't sinned against you, though you hunt to take my life. I love the way David thought through it. I love the way David responded to the person that was doing him wrong. He, he, he declared it. He said, the way that you're treating me is wrong. Okay, but I'm not going to take revenge out on myself. I'm going to be merciful and gracious, and I'm going to leave it to the Lord. That's what David did. And when we're mistreated, we need to take a page out of David's book and, uh, and don't repay evil for evil. Declare it, confront it, and trust God's justice to be done. Second way to respond to that desire for revenge is to aim to live peacefully, peacefully with others. We aim to live peacefully. We might not always hit our target, but we aim for it, okay? Because the Bible recognizes that, you know, there are some people in life that don't want peace. It's going to be that neighbor. It's going to be that family member. It's going to be that person at work or in class at school or what. It's, there's just going to be some people that we encounter in life they don't want peace. They want conflict. They want to fight. They're not going to let it go. You know, uh, back in March, maybe some of you were watching the Gwyneth Paltrow trial on TV. Did you hear about that one? Gwyneth Paltrow, she's like an A-lister Hollywood actress. She was in Iron Man. She was in Shakespeare in Love and all these movies over the years. Anyway, um, she was, uh, her and, and this, this optometrist got into a ski crash um, at a resort in 2016. And uh, uh, the, the guy that got hit um, apparently had some rib damage and some other issues, and his family encouraged him, you know, you should sue Gwyneth Paltrow 
for crashing into you. And, and, and Gwyneth Paltrow just wanted peace. She, did, she said, listen, I'm sorry, you know, but really, you crashed into me. So he says, no, Gwyneth crashed into me. And Gwyneth says, no, you crashed into me. All right? And he says, I don't want peace. I'm going to sue you for $3.1 million. I've crashed into a lot of people when I've been on the ski slopes. I have never been sued for that much money. Well, I've never been sued for crashing into someone, but... Can you believe that? So anyway, uh, they go to court, and, and Gwyneth Paltrow was countersuing this guy for one dollar. Just one dollar, okay? Um, she was taking the high road, and uh, they went through the court proceedings and, and all that, and it was found that, you know, it, it was 100% with the jury. They only deliberated a couple hours, and they said, you know what? This guy was 100% at fault. He crashed into her. She didn't crash into him. And he was just trying to take advantage of her celebrity and wealth. You know, Gwyneth Paltrow is innocent. Bam, court adjourned. So she goes over to the man as she's leaving the court and uh, she leaned down and she just said, I wish you well. I wish you well. All that hassle, all that you know, public spectacle she was gracious. She was trying to live peace. I wish you well. A couple months later, a newspaper got a hold of the guy that sued her and said, do you think you'd do it again? He just said, are you kidding me? Absolutely not. So it's kind of ridiculous, but we'll, we'll encounter that in life sometimes. And the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 12, verse 18, if possible, notice, the Apostle Paul who wrote this letter, he recognizes it's not always possible to live peacefully with others. If possible, so far as it depends on you, in other words, we always have a choice of how we're going to respond. Right, church? We always have a choice how we're going to respond. So far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. You've got to remember who wrote these words. This is the Apostle Paul, the man who administered for over 20 years to spread the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ to the world. And typically, he would start with the Jews, and he would tell his fellow Jews, hey, you know the Messiah that was prophesied in our scriptures? Well, God has sent his only son, our Messiah. It's Jesus. And the Jews rejected that message for the most part. They rejected it. They, they, they didn't want to hear it. They thought Jesus was just a guy who had a Messiah complex. He was crazy. They had seen other people come and go who said they were Messiah. But he did miracles. But he healed people. He did all these things. No, nope, we don't believe it. And by the way, we're going to get you, Paul. And so from town to town, wherever the apostle Paul went, he was persecuted. He was, he was harmed by the Jews. They would do everything they could to kick him out of town, to have him in prison, to have him beaten with whips and with rods. They would throw him in a ditch and throw stones on him. At one point, he was left for dead. I mean, the Apostle Paul has experience in dealing with people that didn't want anything to do with peace. Look what he says. If possible, though, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with others. There was one guy named Alexander. He was a metal worker. He was a coppersmith. And for the Apostle Paul to mention him by name specifically in Scripture, that's a big deal. This guy was Jewish. He was in the, in the Greek city of Ephesus. And he, uh, he didn't believe what the Apostle Paul was saying about Jesus. And he opposed Paul's message greatly, and he harmed the Apostle Paul. And Paul notes it, and he says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 14 to 15, Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The word in Greek for great is mega. He did me mega harm. The Lord will repay him. Notice, he didn't say, I'm going to get him back. Or, hey, Timothy, take this guy out, all right? Paul didn't say that. No, the Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Verse 15, beware of him yourself, Timothy, for he strongly opposed 
our message. Yeah, it's going to happen in times. Sometimes it's just people who, man, they're, they are not going to live peacefully. Uh, when I was a youth pastor, my uh, junior high uh, director came to me one day at a church, and he said, I've got a big problem. I said, what's going on? He said, um, we got a kid in our junior high ministry. You know, he's the most disruptive kid we have. Okay? He never listens. He runs around all the time. He pulls the girl's hair, and he gets in fights with the boys, and he spits on leaders. He's just, he's a nightmare. You know, we do everything we can to try to keep control of him, okay, and to build a relationship. I said, well, what's the problem? And he says, we're going on a mission trip to an orphanage in Mexico, and this kid signed up. Wow. You're going to take him to an orphanage? That's what I said. I said, no. You're not going to a mission trip with an orphanage. You haven't proved that you have the right behavior. I'm not going to let you loose on a bunch of orphans in Mexico. Are you kidding me? I said, okay, I, I'm, I'm with you on that. What's the problem? His father is demanding that we take his son to go on the trip. Really? Have you talked to him? Yes. And he's just, he's just put his foot down? Yes. Anything else? He's going to sue us if we don't take his son. Excuse me? He's going to sue the church if we don't take his son on this mission trip. What's his name? He told me his name. I said, doesn't that guy sing in the choir? Yeah. He sings in our church choir. Are you getting this? A guy in the choir is going to sue his own church. So his disobedient, out-of-control kid can go on a mission trip? That's crazy. So within two weeks, I find myself in a conference room at our church with myself, my junior high guy, my boss, the executive pastor, and this man in our church and his lawyer threatening to sue his own church. I was so mad. I was furious inside. It was, I just told my junior, hold me back because I'm going to punch this guy in the face, right? I was just, in the name of Jesus, bam! I was so mad at this guy. I just, I couldn't believe it. What a travesty. And, and, you know, we're trying to say, well, listen, we would take him, but his behavior is really hard, and he's going to disrupt the group and, and the kids and everything. And the lawyer just says, nope, he has every right uh, for you to take his kid. If not, we'll have to take you to court, blah, blah, blah. And I look over at my boss, the executive pastor. He's a much more calmer individual than I am. He just said, all right, let's see if we work, work something out. Um, and, and we actually did. We found a young adult in our church who was willing to go on the trip and do a one-on-one -on -one with this junior high boy. So they went, and he controlled the kid, and it, it all worked out. But man, man, sometimes you're going to be with people that just aren't going to want to make peace. And, and I learned a lesson from my boss at that church. You know, do everything you can as far as it depends on you to live peacefully with others, even if they don't want anything to do with it. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, on the Sermon on the Mount, this comes from a section we call the Beatitudes. He said in Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers. Notice, he didn't say the peacekeepers, the peacemakers. Our call is to make peace find ways to have peace with those who oppose us. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons and daughters of God. Hmm. Good reminder, not easy to do. Third way to respond to revenge is to leave the payback to God. Got to leave the payback to God, because again, <laughs> seems like that's our nature. We want to get Take, take revenge into our own hands. Hey, I don't see God. Where's God? How's he going to help out? Looks like I'm going to have to handle this myself. And we see that attitude. It's common in our culture. Every night when I turn on the local news, I see, you know, one gang is getting revenge on another gang, you know, in Stockton or Sacramento or somewhere. It's just like, wow, that's part of the culture. We see it in base. Any baseball fans out here? If you watch a lot of baseball, you know that revenge is part of the culture. If a pitcher hits a batter and it looks like it was intentional, I guarantee you when that pitcher's team is up to bat, the first batter is going to get hit. That's just baseball culture, right? That's how they do it. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, man. It's payback. 
And we also see revenge um, glorified in the movies, too. Um, there was a movie that came out a while back called Gladiator. You remember that one? And uh, Russell Crowe played the part of Maximus, and he was general of the Roman armies. And, um, and Caesar's son betrayed his father and took the throne and, and got rid of, of General Maximus and had his wife and son killed. And, and the general was then... Um, uh, he became a slave and ultimately a gladiator for the sport and entertainment of the Romans. So he was in the Colosseum, and right after a, an incredible victory, um, he finally had his chance to face the false Caesar who had caused him all this pain and heartache in his life. Uh, check out this scene. And I will have my revenge in this life or the next. Get him, Maximus, right? Yeah. We feel that way, man. We see a scene like that. I was like, yeah, get your revenge, man. Take that guy out. Well, for Christians, that's not really our option. The Bible tells us in Romans 12, verse 19, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Now, we talked about revenge as being that personal desire to inflict equal pain or more on the person that's hurt you. But uh, vengeance is different. Vengeance uh, seeks that justice, the right response is done to the wrongdoer, that the wrongdoer is held accountable. And I got news for you. Scripture teaches that God himself reserves that right. Only God. Talks about the wrath of God as God uh, does his vengeance for those of us who have been hurt in this life, the wrongdoer will receive the wrath of God. That's his divine anger and punishment upon evildoers. And I don't know if you've read the last book of the New Testament called Revelation, but that shows a lot of God's wrath upon a sinful, rebellious, and unbelieving world. And it's no place you want to be. Jesus himself, the Son of God, suffered unjustly in this life. But even Jesus didn't take out revenge. He gave it to his Father in heaven. It tells us in the book of 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23, when Jesus was reviled, he did not revile in return. When Jesus suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him, his Father, who judges justly. Again, another model by the way Jesus handled incredible uh, abuse and suffering at the hands of, of wrongdoers. So let me put this on the screen. Leaving vengeance in the hands of God accomplishes at least three things. One, obedience on our part. And we, when we obey God's word and do what he tells us to do, we're, we, we please God. So that's a good thing. Number two, it allows time for the wrongdoer to realize what they've done. Perhaps have a change of mind and heart and repent of their sin. And thirdly, it allows God's justice to be done in his timing and in his way. Again, not our will be done, but your will be done, Father. Now, it's interesting. Back to our example of David. David understood this. And David left the vengeance to God. In that conversation with King Saul, uh, David said in 1 Samuel chapter 24, verse 13, as the proverb of the ancients says, out of the wicked comes wickedness, but my hand, King Saul, shall not be against you. Verse 15, may the Lord, and he's saying Yahweh, the one true God, may Yahweh, therefore, be judge and give sentence between me and you and see to it and plead my cause and deliver me from your hand. 
David left the payback to God. And often, God pays back through the governing authorities. Um, we see this in Romans 13, verse 4. We're going to look at this a little bit more next time we get into Romans. But it says, For he, that is the governing authorities, he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. In other words, God has given authority to governments to punish the wrongdoer. And that includes believers. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out what? God's wrath on who? The wrongdoer. So if somebody wrongs you and they've hurt you or your family and you think a lightning bolt from heaven is going to come down and strike the person, probably not going to happen that way. God will typically work through the governing authorities that he has established. As hard as that is. You know, back in uh, June of 2015, there was a Bible study being held um, in the AME Church of Charleston, South Carolina. And a young man named Dylan Roof came into the church and asked if he could join the Bible study, which he did. Um, and afterwards, he took out a gun and he shot dead nine of the people including the pastor. They were black. He was white. It was a hate crime. He went to jail. He was accused and convicted. And at his sentencing, the relatives of the victims were able to say their peace to this messed up young man with the evil deed that he had done. And one woman named Nadine Collier, she was the daughter of a 70-year-old woman, her mother, who was murdered at that Bible study. And she said this to her mother's killer. She said, you took something very, very precious from me. I will never talk to my mother again. I will never, ever hold my mother again. But I forgive you from my heart, and may the Lord have mercy on your soul. Wow. An example of someone leaving the payback to God. Final way to respond when we want revenge is to kill them with kindness. <laughs> kill them with kindness. That's right. One of your fill-ins is kill, okay? But it's a figure of speech, okay? Figure of speech. Kill them with kindness. My dad always used to say that to me when I was a kid and I would get mad at somebody who did me wrong and I wanted to get back at them and I was planning my revenge. My dad would say, hey, son, come here, come here. Tell you what, just kill them with kindness. Dad, what does that even mean? It means that you just kind of let it go, all right? Okay, you can still be cordial, maybe even be nice, okay? And, and when you kill them with kindness, then they'll, they hopefully will realize what they did was wrong, man. And they'll be convicted by that. I'd rather hit them, Dad. No, no, no. So the Bible even preaches this in Romans 12, verses 20 and 21. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If your enemy is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. In other words, kill him with kindness. Okay? Uh, now, it doesn't mean that we don't protect ourselves from harm. It doesn't say that we can't defend ourselves in Scripture, okay? We can do that. It's talking about being vengeful, seeking revenge. And, and, and Scripture says, listen, if people are, are insulting you with their words or hurting you um, with their fists or abusing you in other ways, listen, <laughs> give that to the Lord in prayer and in trust and instead, if your enemy comes to you and they're hungry, give them something to eat. Show them hospitality. Wow, wait a minute. How can I do that? I hate it when the Bible teaches stuff like this. This is hard. 
This is a hard teaching of Scripture. Are you kidding me, Pastor? Do you know what my stepsister did to me? Do you know what my ex did to me? You have no idea what my boss did to me at work or my co Are you kidding me? Go to Taco Bell and get him a burrito? That ain't happening. No way. I'm supposed to feed him? Give him something to drink? What are you talking about? Hey, listen, I didn't write it. I'm just the messenger, okay? That's what it says. That's the kind of heart we're to have. That was the heart of, of Jesus when he prayed to those who were crucifying him, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's the heart of Jesus. And burning coals on top of their head, that gives it the idea that, you know what, when we respond with the kindness of Jesus that we can only do through the power and indwelling of the Holy Spirit within us, when we dig down deep and somehow, by a miracle, we're able to treat those who have hurt us and caused us pain with hospitality. It's like pouring burning coals on their head. <laughs> In other words, that'll probably create shame upon them and, and, and it'll convict their conscience and hopefully turn them to God in repentance. That's what it's talking about. So as we wrap up here, you know, maybe, uh, maybe you've been done wrong by someone. Uh, maybe a friend betrayed you, or a neighbor insulted you, or is just making your life really difficult. Maybe your boss has demeaned you in some way, or, or your spouse has been unfaithful or cheated on you. Maybe your coach has benched you Maybe your teachers treated you unfairly. Maybe your parents have failed you. Maybe a person took advantage of you in some way. And that's not easy. It hurts. It hurts deep within. And you're telling me, you're telling me, Pastor, that I'm supposed to forgive them? and show them kindness and hospitality? What kind of a teaching is this? I know. I think the only way it's possible is through the power of God's Holy Spirit within us. I think that's the only way it's possible. It, it, it has to go beyond ourselves. It has to go beyond our natural inclinations to want to take out our revenge, get our pound of flesh, and even the score. It can only be through the incredible and dwelling presence and power of the Holy Spirit within us that can enable us to forgive and to show kindness and to pray for those who have hurt us. Amen, church. That's a tough amen. Jesus put it this way. His words in Luke chapter 6, verses 27 to 28. Jesus said, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Wow. We do that, and our reward will be in heaven, and we will be called sons and daughters of the Most High God.